purchase agreement, but it's not the uh, HDA sale and purchase agreement. This is the sub sale sale and purchase agreement. Okay, so I will just share the essential terms. I won't show you the whole agreement, so you tak mengantuk, alright? Okay, just uh, pinpoint. So, first thing, when you open the sale and purchase agreement, definitely you can see the parties. Okay, this is very important. Vendor is the one who actually selling the property. The purchaser is the one actually who buying the property. So, this will come first at the very beginning of the sale and purchase agreement. Then, okay, how to describe the parties? What will you see in the sale and purchase agreement? Okay, first, you, can, you, 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 must, you, you must actually put in the individual name, the purchaser name or the vendor name. Or if they are company, then you have to put in the company name, right? Okay, IC number. If they are Malaysian citizen, you need to put in an RIC number. Or if let's say they are foreigner, then we must put in passport number. This is very important. Foreigner individual must put in passport number because in all the future land office uh, transaction or the form, we must put in the foreigner passport number, not the NR, uh, not their actually their own country identity card number, right? Okay, if let's say it's a Malaysia company, you must put in the SSM registration number because now SSM already have a new number for all the companies in Malaysia, so you must put in the new and old company number. So foreign company, as usual, you just put in their, the, the company uh, registration number. Actually, they're registered in their own country. So this is all about the parties. Go next. How to next? Okay. Next, after parties, you, you, sometimes you will see the property details like uh, uh, the title, what is the type of the property, all those we call it as a recital. Recital, not everything you can put in, okay? You don't put in all the terms and conditions in the recital. Recital basically is just talking about the fact or the background of the property or the transaction itself, okay? First, Okay, you can see first, we must put in the property details like uh, a unit of condominium, a unit of, uh, one unit of the terrace house or bungalow or, or what, whatever type of property. And then you will see the together. After that, we will say uh, held under a uh, structure title, uh, individual title or a master title and then together with all the property uh, title uh, details. This title details, you must always compare with the uh, copy of the title that you have. Make sure everything correctly stated because if you wrongly stated, it will affect the loan. It will affect all your subsequent documents like the MOT, the deal of assignment, your adjudication, everything will wrong. So this one very important. And also second things, you will always, uh, you will always actually saw from the agreement that they will also always uh, mention whether the property is free from encumbrances or they are actually assigned or charged to a bank. Free from encumbrances means the property actually no loan, no caveat, everything clear. It's a very straightforward case. So we will see from the title, they will only show the name of the registered owner or we call the proprietor. Okay, so if you see from the title itself, you can see uh, there is a charge, charge, what we call the charge, um, Gadayan. If you see the Gadayan presentation number or the bank names, means the property itself actually is charged to a bank. So we will call the bank, in the title case, we call it Chargy Bank, or if in the deal of assignment, what, what we call is in a master agreement, is a, sorry, master the title, if the property is still under master title, we can't see the, I mean the, the, the vendor's bank details in the title. You will only can know from the loan agreement to be provided by the vendor. So this one, you must get it from, you must ask for the documents from the uh, vendor itself or the vendor lawyer. So to confirm whether the property actually, they actually assigned to the bank or not, right? From the title itself also, you can see, we must put in also, you can see uh, whether there's any private caveat, registrar caveat, or lien holder caveat put in, in the agreement. 
uh, in the title. So if yes, please actually uh, indicate it in this in the recital of the sale and purchase agreement so everybody will know. Okay, uh, when we prepare the documents like the MOT or for the signing documents, okay, you will put in the relevant details in the MOT or other documents that you will need to prepare based on the recital or the title of the property. So this one very important. So to make sure the title can be registered at the end of the day, okay? The fourth thing, you will always uh, see there is, uh, if let's say there is a restriction interest, in restriction interest actually is the sakata kepentingan. You can, you can actually know whether there's sakata kepentingan or not from the title itself. You can, you can, you can actually always refer to the title. If there is, like, let's say, Tana ini tidak boleh dipindah milik, or Tana ini boleh dipindah milik dengan kebenaran uh, pihak kuasa uh, negeri. This is what we call the restriction interest, or in Malay, we call it sekatan kepentingan. If there is, please also put it in the recital. So when people look at the recital, when people open the first page of the sale and purchase agreement, they will know all the relevant info for this property and for the transaction. Okay. And also fifth, people will always uh, uh, actually return in the agreement also in the recital whether the property actually is selling with vacant compensation or with the existing tenancy. Vacant compensation means the house will be delivered to you uh, with nobody staying inside. If let's say the property itself actually is already rendered out to someone so you, this one you must also indicate in the recital of the sale and purchase agreement because at the end of the day the purchaser won't get the uh, vacant position of the property but together with the tenant means they will take over the tenancy or if let's say they don't want the tenancy then maybe the vendor need to actually send a notice of uh, notice to quit from uh, to this uh, tenant I mean to quit from the property and to deliver VP. Okay, this will be the arrangement between the party. And also whether the property will actually is sold on as its waste basis. As its waste basis is uh, what you see now, what you see now, okay? If let's say no, they, they, there are some cases they will say, okay, it's not on as its waste basis, but the vendor actually undertake to rectify a certain part of the uh, uh, property like uh, leakage uh, or they, they will touch up some things uh, like the wall and all those things. So this one also must be very st uh, clearly stated. If there must be touch up something or there uh, some leakage ratification work, we, we won't call it on as a as its waste basis, right? And also normally we will see from the reciter who is uh, representing solicitor, solicitor for the vendor and also the purchaser. So this is all about the recital. Just put in the background and the fact of the property or the transaction. Okay, all the terms and conditions, please don't put in the recital. It will confuse people. Just make it as simple as possible. Okay, next. So after the recital, then we will go into the terms and conditions of the sale and purchase agreement. So from here, you will see the clause one sometimes up to 20, 30 clauses, okay? So all those things, we call it uh, terms and conditions of sale purchase agreement. The first thing you will see is this, uh, what we call the agreement to sell. When the agree, agrees to sell and purchaser agree to purchase the property on uh, as its way basis or on whatever basis the party already agreed or and together with VP, the vacant position or together with the tenancy. So what all those we call it agreement to sell. We put it in a one a paragraph, normally one or two uh, sub clauses. Uh, what we call it sub clauses under the first uh, first clause of the of the sale purchase agreement. And also sometimes we will put in the property actually is together with the feature and fittings or not, or it's just a bare unit. If let's say that is together with the feature and fittings, then you must actually annex the list of the feature and fittings at the uh, latter part of the sale and purchase agreement. Normally, it's actually after the uh, execution page of the sale and purchase agreement. So, at the end of the day, when the vendor delivers the property, then they have to make sure all the feature and fittings, the list, it's actually all the items listed and attached together with the sale and purchase agreement are delivered together with the property. If not, the purchaser, most probably they will ask for compensation. 
right? Because uh, you already agreed to deliver, but you are not able. So the purchaser will deem it as actually is actually included in the sale of the, 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 the purchase price. So make sure all the, all the agreed items are delivered. If not, it will be a big hoo-ha later on, okay? And also we will put in the agreed purchase price. Uh, the agreed purchaser is like um, uh, agreed to purchase this uh, property at the purchase price of Ringgit Malaysia, let's say 1 million, okay? This is all we put in in the uh, very first beginning of the terms and condition of the SBA. So next will be the payment of the purchase price. After we talk about all those agreement, then we will talk, okay, how to pay the purchase price. We will normally break it down in uh, two, two big uh, uh, different uh, portion. The first, we will call it as a deposit. Right. Second, we will call it a balance purchase price or balance sum. Sometimes you will see a different uh, a terms used in the different uh, sale purchase agreement. Deposit itself actually will actually break it in few part as well. Okay. If the first is the earnest deposit. This one is actually the payment where the purchaser will pay to the vendor agent or pay to the agent solicitor and stakeholder upon the acceptance of, upon the signing of this uh, letter of offer, or what we call the offer to purchase. There are several uh, terms used, uh, or letter of confirmation of sale. Okay, normally this, this all those uh, offer to purchase, a letter of confirmation of sale, all those actually prepared by the property agent. But sometimes if there is no property agent involved, lawyer will also get involved actually in preparing all those. Okay, so they will mention how much is the earnest deposit to be paid. Normally, it's two or three percent. It's actually uh, to be negotiated between the parties, and also when to pay. Normally, mm -hmm. earnest deposit will be paid upon signing of the or acceptance uh, of the letter of confirmation for sale. And then the deposit will also con uh, uh, will also actually include this uh, RBGT retention sum. So we need to break all those in the sale and purchase agreement and the deposit part. RBGT retention sum is required if let's say the property, uh, no, I think now everybody need to pay for the RBGT, okay? So you have to break it down, how much is the uh, retention sum required? And this, the retention sum has to be follow the, the, the fixed rate, uh, actually fixed by the, what we call the uh, DG of the Inland Revenue Board, okay? Now the rate will be 3%, if the seller is a Malaysian citizen, a Malaysia company, or 7% of the purchase price, if let's say the seller is a foreigner or a, is a, or, or a company actually controlled by a foreigner or foreign company, okay? So only after deduct the earnest deposit and the, retention, the arbitrary retention sum, then the balance deposit will be paid to the vendor. So all those breakdown must be make it very clear in the agreement stated down, okay? So all those end up will be the deposit. Deposit sometimes and usually it will be 10% of the purchase price. But some transaction, they actually will agree on the other sum, like maybe 20%, 30% is actually up to the party's negotiation and the agreement. Okay, so we just prepare based on whatever uh, stated in the offer to purchase or the letter of confirmation for sale. And also, after the deposit, then we need to talk about how to pay the balance purchase price. How much, when to pay. Okay, within, within how long, maybe 30 days, uh, maybe 90 days, maybe three months, four months, and who to pay. Definitely is the purchaser to pay or the purchaser bank to pay and pay to who. And normally this balance purchase price will be paid either to the vendor solicitor as stakeholder first, or if vendor is not representing, then pay the purchaser solicitor as stakeholder, and it will be released to the vendor in accordance with the agreed terms of the sale purchase agreement. Okay. This balance purchase price, normally we use for what purpose? First, redemption sum, if the property is actually charged to the bank, assigned to the bank, and, and also sometimes we use to that the um, apportionment of outgoings and also sometimes the rental deposit if the property is uh, actually sold together with the tenancy, the tenancy apportionment for the, the, the monthly rental, 
and only the remaining balance, which is right after deducting all those, will be released to the vendor. Okay. That is about the completion period. So this one, completion period means uh, they sell the balance purchase right, you need to actually pay by the purchaser to the vendor within how long. And also, when will it be started? It will start from the SPA date or the unconditional date. If let's say the property actually is free for encumbrance, uh, is a is a oh sorry, it's actually not subject to any condition precedence like the uh, approval uh, from the state or some conditions that actually uh, agreed between the parties. Then it will start from the date of the sale and purchase agreement. Unconditional date will only come in if let's say the transaction itself is subject to the consent to transfer or to some other conditions that the party agreed upon. So normally it will be 90 days or three months or four months or six months. It depends on the party's agreement. Okay. Normally the, the sentence will be the, the, the clauses will be read, read like this. Uh, the purchase price shall be paid by the or the balance purchase price shall be paid by the purchaser to the vendor's solicitor and stakeholder within three months from the date of the SPA or three months from the date of the uh, or three months from the unconditional date. It depends on your the each uh different situation ticket circumstances for each property right and also completion period always or, or i cannot say always uh, is actually normally it could be extend and it, it actually normally extend uh, for another one month 30 days two months three months is actually up to the uh, party negotiation but for the normal and terms that uh, usual that we or the usual terms is actually extend okay all those have to be actually indicated in the sale materials agreement so if let's say come to the part of the extension definitely it will come together with the interest how much the purchaser need to pay the vendor for the extension let's say for one month normally the rate will be eight percent but sometimes it could be reduced to six percent or sometimes it could be up to ten percent this one also free negotiation between the parties, right? Accept the uh, extension of one month or, or, or what we call the 30 days. It could always, uh, the completion period could always be extended if let's say there's any delay, okay? On the vendor part or the vendor bank, what we call the chargee or the uh, assignee. So this one we will discuss later on at the later part or the redemption or, or the release of the documents. Okay, so normally all this automatic extension due to the delay is free of interest. Okay. So next, we will also mention about how to deliver the documents. What are the documents and when, how, what I call is what, what documents to deliver, when you need to deliver and how to deliver. All right, so normally the, the, the documents normally we will see is a certified true copy of the NIC of the vendor or the purchaser. If let's say foreigner, we must ask for a copy, certified true copy of the passport. All those actually to verify the identity of the party. Okay, if let's say company, we will ask for the constitution. We will ask for, last time we asked for the form 24, 44, 49. Now uh, they actually come up with a different, different uh, section name. Uh, so you have to list it out and also if there's a company if let's say vendor or either the producer is a company board resolution board of directors resolution is a must this is to authorize the uh, part uh, the company to enter the sale purchase agreement all those must be certified through copy okay company documents and resolution must be certified through copy by the company secretary not by the lawyer. Lawyer, please do not certify through copy the company documents because you are not you, you are not the officer or you are not the authorized person or you are not the person who signed the original documents of the company. So please do not simply certify through copy of the company's document. On you will, it can only be certified either by the company secretary, which is this is the requirement from the land office, or by the director in some circumstances only. Okay. Second, we must ask for copy of title. It is very important. 
because this one we will need to extract all the details, all the info for us to put it in the in the recital of the sale of purchase agreement just now. So make sure it's it's tally, make sure that is uh there's no suspicious transaction uh, that you can actually or uh, actually found in this in the title itself. And also please always remember to conduct a land search. Okay, before you, you finalize or even before you draft a sale and purchase agreement. This is very important because the copy of title or even the original title given or provided by this vendor to you may not the up-to-date one. Because even after the title itself, I mean, uh, passed to the vendor, it could be always a uh, charge ender. I mean, this is, let's say, copy of title is given. Or maybe there are private caveat, there are... There are others uh, actually transaction entered into the uh, property itself. And it won't be actually endorsed on the copy of title if the copy of title itself actually is an old version, is an old title, it's not an up to date title. So, land search is very important. Not only refer to the title, but also the land search. Right? As the first, the third thing is the principal sale and purchase agreement or the previous sale and purchase agreement. Principal sale and purchase agreement is very important if let's say the property is still under the master title. Means no strata title issue yet or no individual title issue yet. Principal SPA in such a circumstances actually carry a same weight as the original title. The bank will ask for it. Okay, make sure everything put it in the Every, every actually information in the principal SPA is tallied with your SPA and tallied with whatever documents or information given by the vendor or the property agent to you. Okay, so the fourth item is quit rent assessment. What we call it is a chukai dana, chukai pindu. Chukai dana is very important because we can actually verify whether the, there is a amendment of the title, uh, title, I mean, a title number from the latest quit rent. Assessment very important because we will have to verify the property hosted address from the assessment. Sometimes it may be same, sometimes it may be different a bit, okay? But it will be very important because the bank definitely will ask for it. Uh, the fifth one is, if let's say your property is under master title, what we call is assignment case, then you have to request for all the agreements from the vendor or the vendor solicitor from the very beginning, the principal sale and purchase agreement, the first loan agreement, the deal receivery assignment to all the uh, agreement up to the window stage, means the vendor SPA and the loan agreement. This is very important and must be indicated in the recital as well, if let's say it's a master title case, because this will actually to prove the chain of uh, ownership of the vendor. So to make sure there is no break down, uh, there's no break in between of the change of ownership. If there is a break, there must be something wrong. So this is very important. So the CTC, the vendor definitely has to deliver to the purchaser, CTC IC. So title is from the vendor to the to the purchaser or to the purchaser lawyer. Principal, quit rent, and uh, and assignment, and all those actually is from the vendor to the purchaser lawyer or the purchaser, okay? So, um, number five is the condition precedent. This one also, also very important. You must remember to put this in if let's say there is a sakatan that requests for the consent to transfer, or if let's say the purchaser is a foreigner individual or a foreign company. If you have omitted this part or this condition precedent or this call, uh, what we call the consent to transfer, the bank won't release the money. Everybody will get stuck. And also the title and the ownership cannot be transferred because land office won't allow the transfer without the consent obtained or the bank or, or the actually the assignment is actually what we call is invalid because the relevant condition precedent or the relevant approval is not obtained. So this is what this is very important. Make sure you check the title, you check the land search properly. Okay, if let's say there is, you must put it in as a condition precedent. Okay, and also okay, you must take note also not all the list of property are subject to restriction or subject to sakata. You you always need to check 
uh, the title. You, you don't immediately after after uh, saw the title, oh, this is the list, so there must be a condition precedent, there must be a consent, and I must uh, put in the consent to transfer as a condition precedent. No, this is wrong. You must always refer to the title or the language. And also, not the freehold property is without restriction. The freehold property means this Lama Lama near the mention is in the agreement. Sometimes also you need to uh, obtain a, what we call the consent to transfer. Okay, this one also depends on each state of the where the property actually fall within, right? So must remember to check title, 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 and title, right? Do not assume because any assumption made by a lawyer will actually cause a delay or cause a transaction to be terminated or cancelled or even the lawyer need to pay to pay for all those uh, charges and also the lawyer will, might be sued as well by the relevant parties okay and also it's a foreigner make sure foreigner acquisition approval actually also put it as a condition precedent there are some states in Malaysia required uh, a foreigner acquisition approval if the master title is still under, if the property is still under master title. But there are some stages that actually uh, mention very clear in their actually uh, respective uh, guideline or policy that uh, master title foreigner no need to apply for consent. So all those you must check properly. You must you must check actually with the relevant state. Don't assume. Okay. And sometimes FEA also could be a condition precedent. This is only actually applied to certain case. So the lawyer must check, always check with the guidelines, the updated guidelines, not only the guidelines, the updated guidelines, because the state will actually uh, update or renew their guidelines from time to time. So you must always remember to check, okay? Do not use back the old, old version five or six years ago. Sorry, that is updated. Okay, you will get it wrong later. Okay, number six. Okay, we will mention the the uh, the, the transfer instrument is either the uh, form for the fourteen A or what we call the memorandum transfer. Or if let's say the property is still under master title, so we will use the deed of assignment by what transfer as the instrument to transfer. So you must. Uh, Please do not put MOT if let's say the property is under master title. People will laugh at you. Okay. So and also the assignment, this will only apply for the property under master title. So property with title is MOT, property under master title is DOA. Okay, sometimes there will be a, some uh, circumstances where property is actually with title, means the title already issued, but the vendor haven't transferred, have a perfect the transfer, what we call the perfect. They haven't actually complete the professional transfer or professional charge. So in this case, it could be direct transfer. The transfer will be by a direct transfer means a transfer from the developer to the purchaser directly, or it could be a double, double transfer. Means you have to complete the first transfer from the developer to the vendor first, then only you can proceed with the transfer to the purchaser. How to determine whether this property is to be a uh, completed by web trial transfer or double transfer, please always check with the developer. You must get the developer consent if you want to do a direct transfer. If developer not allowed for direct transfer, no choice, you have to complete by way of double transfer. Right? And also, if let's say um, the property actually is subject to some uh, consent to transfer or foreigner consent, most probably the vendor, I mean, the developer won't allow for direct transfer because they may have already get the blanket consent or the consent approval previously. If they allow it, in some circumstances or in some uh, cases, developer need to do some what we call, uh, go through some procedure, what we call is a Pata Gandhi. So all those, you must write into the developer, get the developer to confirm in, re in, uh, in writing. Okay, please don't assume. Don't just draft the agreement based on whatever verbally confirmed by the developer. You must get it uh, confirmed by the developer in under their letterhead. If let's say the developer not able to confirm or you not able to confirm before the SBA sign, please put in the option for direct transfer and double transfer to gather the to gather the whole transaction. Okay. Uh, 
for the assignment case, that uh, means the property is still under master title. You must actually uh, to make sure or to ascertain whether the property they are selling actually is a residential property like the condominium, service apartment, or is a non-residence uh, property. If let's say residential property, you only need to let, get the letter of confirmation from the developer to confirm all the property details, the ownership, okay, is correct. Or if let's say the property is a non-residential property like a shop lot, office lot, factory, then others you must get a letter of consent, which is, this is the vendor obligation, to get a letter of consent to sell from the developer. And also the deal assignment must be endorsed by the developer for this uh, non-residential property. Okay, this letter of consent to sell normally will come together with a uh, charges, the consent charges. It could be up to 1% of the purchase price or sometimes it's just a nominal charges like 500, 1000, depends on the developer. Right? Number seven is if let's say the property is sell is actually with a uh, uh, charge or signing what we call the vendor actually has its own bank which is not settled yet so in the agreement my put in redemption statement come undertaking what is redemption statement the redemption statement is a statement issued by the vendor's bank okay which will actually uh, indicate how much is the outstanding loan sum that need to be settled by the vendor okay, to redeem the property from the bank and to transfer to the purchaser. In this redemption statement also, make sure, when we receive it, make sure it's actually come together with the undertaking from the vendor's bank. This is very important. The undertaking is actually, uh, for example, is like this. Well, the bank will undertake to execute the discharge of charge or the execute the deal receipt the assignment upon receive the uh, redemption sum and also the bank will also the vendors bank also will undertake to release the original title or to release the principal sum purchase agreement on all such uh, what we call the security documents to the purchaser or to the vendor upon full payment of the redemption statement when you receive the redemption statement, make sure all the details, especially the vendor's name and the property details are tally with your sale materials agreement. Okay. Normally, we will put it in the agreement. The vendor have to be obtained and deliver this uh, redemption statement to the purchaser or the purchaser bank solicitor within how many days. Okay. It's not very important. It's either 14 days or 14 working days up to the party negotiation. Okay. Why it is important? Okay, I will explain to you why it is important later on. And also, uh, the, the second thing is the, uh, you, you must put in uh, when to release the original title and the discharge to the purchaser lawyer or the purchaser bank's lawyer, uh, principal, SBA, other security, and r and within how many days? All those period of times mentioned in the agreement are very important. Lawyer must bear in mind. Executive must bear in mind, all those time periods are very important. We, we are not actually putting in the time period just for fun. Remember, because any delay or every delay, you might need to pay for the delay based on the agreed uh, interest rate. If the delay is because of the lawyer delay or because the lawyer not following up or the because of the lawyer omission, you will see the vendor definitely will go to you and ask for compensation. Very important. Always, always remember to check your agreement. Immediately after you receive a, a, what we call the uh, request from the purchaser solicitor, you cannot just put aside and let it uh, stay there for a week or two weeks. Please don't do that because it will, it will, it will incur a lot, a lot of uh, what we call the, the, the charges or the interest, okay? Please always always check your, what we call the time frame in the agreement, not just for fun. Once the party is agreed on, the lawyer have to act accordance with the agreement, okay? The purchaser, sometimes they will pay by cash, sometimes they will pay by loan. So this one, 
uh, we have to put the option in the agreement as well, right? If let's say adjacent want to pay by loan, so what is the actually obligation of the producer if the producer want to pay by the bank financing, what we call the loan? Uh -huh. So the producer lawyer or the producer financing lawyer, they have to actually uh, obtain a financial undertaking from the bank and deliver to the vendor. Okay, and also the producer have to settle the differential loan sum if there is any. Differential loan sum means the loan amount, the clean loan amount. Uh. Okay, if let's say you only obtain 80% of your loan and your deposit that you already paid is a 10%, so there will be a remaining 10% that the purchaser need to fork up his actually uh, own fund and then pay to the vendor solicitor as a stakeholder. Okay, this one uh, must be put it in the agreement as well. When the, if let's say the purchaser is getting loan, what is the vendor application? When they need to deliver a letter undertaking to refund to the bank. When they need to sign a statutory declaration for non-bankrupt. Okay, and also the vendor solicitor, please remember, after you receive the differential loan sum, don't just put it in the account. You must come up with a confirmation letter also for the differential loan sum settlement. Okay, any delay on this settlement and or any delay on giving any documents, as, uh, as I mentioned just now, it will actually causing a delay. A delay means money, right? It's either vendor will actually lose the uh, the money or vendor will lose the money or the purchaser will actually lose the money. If not to the, due to the purchaser or vendor, definitely is the lawyer who are going to pay for their delay, right? Please remember, always remember on the time frame. As a sub -sale lawyer, as a lawyer who actually doing handling all those sub -sale agreement time, we must always remember the time, right? Cash, then if let's say it's a cash purchaser, the most important thing is you need as to ascertain when to release the original title and how to release. And normally this is actually after full settlement of purchase price, okay? Number nine is about the representation and the warranties, okay? This one must actually spell, spell out uh, clearly. Uh, make sure it's actually is enough and not just one two so the for the example the norm the norm the 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 the, the representation of the warning normally we can actually always uh uh, uh so from the agreement is a to confirm the ownership means uh the register it will read like this uh, sometimes the vendor is a registered provider and beneficiary uh, or the or the beneficial owner of the property this is one of the representation or the vendor has the full authority or full power to enter into the sale purchase agreement or the vendor is not bankrupt, there is no uh, bankruptcy proceeding. This is some of the example of the representation of warranties. As for the purchaser, some vendor they will ask for the warranty or representation from the purchaser as well. So uh, purchaser not much, uh, normally it's on the power to enter SPA if they are company or the foreigner and there is no bankruptcy or no one uh, proceeding and all those things. Okay, so we must actually mention in the agreement also what is consequences if let's say the parties breach their representation of warranties. It's either entitled for them to terminate as for compensation or to seek for specific performance. Okay, let's say if there's a breach, we will always actually provide a clause for them to uh, remedy the breach. Let's say within how long, 30 days, 14 days, Actually, this is depends on the party negotiation. And also in the representation clause, we will always put in the indemnity clause. Uh, for example, the vendor will always indemnify uh, the purchaser for any uh, representation or when this uh, wrongly made or breach of the representation. So the vendor have to indemnify the purchaser from all the costs, damages, claims, or whatever proceeding arise because of the breach of the vendor's representation or because of the breach of the purchaser representation. All those must be covered in the sale purchase agreement. Number 10, default. Default could be come from the vendor or by the vendor or default could be uh, by the purchaser. Default by the purchaser sometimes uh, 
uh, when, uh, default by the vendor, it could be because the vendor actually make a wrong representation of warranties or the vendor, they refuse or they uh, unable to complete the transaction due to their own reason. Okay, it's not due to the government change of policy or it's not due to uh, some uh, reason that beyond the control. So if always due to the vendor own problem or own reason, or sometimes they say I can find a, a better uh, purchaser with a better, a higher purchase price, then they just uh, purposely or willingly, de I mean default this agreement, then this is the, the default, they actually entitle the purchaser to terminate the agreement or to seek for specific performance. If let's say terminate, it always come to a come together with the agreed liquidated damages, which is normally a 10% of the purchase price. Which if let's say it is because of the vendor fault and the purchaser want to terminate, then the vendor have to refund all the money, all the purchase price that the vendor already received from the purchaser. And also the vendor also need to pay another sum, another additional sum, let's say 10% of the purchase price as a, a uh, liquidated damages for the vendor breach. Or if let's say the purchaser want to seek for a specific performance, means uh, if let's say the purchaser, the purchaser is of the view that, okay, money is not enough, not sufficient. Okay, I want you to perform or to complete this transaction, okay, because I know you can do it and you willingly actually terminate it, then the purchaser will have an option to apply or to seek for specific performance from the court. Okay, so once the gotten the order from the court, then actually the vendor are forced or compelled to complete the transaction. If let's say the default is by the purchaser, means uh, normally it's because due to lack of fund, because have no money, or suddenly, okay, they cannot get the bank finance or the producer got finance problem in between of the transaction, then the vendor always can terminate if they cannot complete within a completion period. Or, uh, yeah, always is a termination. If terminate, then the purchaser 10% uh, deposit will normally be forfeited by the vendor as a damages to the vendor. So there were also uh, some actually clauses uh, in the agreement that uh, they will provide a time for the vendor or for the purchaser to remedy. So it up to the parties how long is the period. If let's say cannot, then each party can do a decision. If because of the vendor, for then purchaser can decide either to terminate or ask for specific performance. Or if because of the purchaser, the vendor can always terminate and forfeit the 10%. Okay. Another clause, very important, real property can start because this is the statutory uh, obligation. So, uh, okay, first you must actually uh, ascertain whether this transaction in this transaction in this purchase agreement, the vendor actually is subject to RBGT or income tax. There are some company actually need to pay for RBGT. There are some company they actually need to pay for income tax. Always check with the vendor. Ask, advise the vendor to check with their auditor. They're actually holding it as a, what we call as an asset or they're holding it as an investment. It will be a different tax treatment. Don't immediately assume if they are selling property, then they must pay for the RBGD. No, this one always check with the vendor, ask the vendor to check with their auditor. Okay, so if there is RBGD, need to be paid or need to be retained under the RBGD Act, then make sure the RPGD, the retention sum actually is uh, actually retained by the purchaser or the purchaser lawyer in accordance with the law, right? Under the section, if I'm not mistaken, 21A or B, it should be 21B of the RPGD Act, actually mentioned that the purchaser has the obligation to retain a sufficient sum, which is either 3% or 7%. It depends on, uh, it's uh, actually a, uh, the seller is a foreigner or, uh, or, or Malaysian citizen from the purchase price and to actually submit to the uh, DG of the Inland Revenue Board within 60 days from the SPA date or 60 days from the unconditional date. Any delay or the payment will cause 
you a late payment interest, which is 10% of the payable tax. Okay. Lawyer must be remember, must be remember to follow the timeline. Okay, because the purchaser lawyer will always be the priority to retain the sum. Once you retain the sum, please remember you have 60 days to pay. Okay. I will advise you to pay as soon as the SPS stamp or as soon as the consent is obtained. Please do not delay or, or actually put it aside until one day you forget about it. Then you will the, the vendor or the processor will cut penalty and they will ask you to pay for it. Okay. Uh, remember the time to submit the CKHD 1A means this is actually the declaration form uh, requested or stated in the RPGD Act, CKHD 1A, CKHD 2A or CKHD 3, all those forms must be submitted to the LHDN as well. I mean what we call the Inner Revenue Board within 60 days from the SPA date or from the unconditional date. Please always check your agreement see which date is applicable for you, right? Uh, in this uh, RPGT clause as well, it will always come together with the indemnity by the vendor. The vendor always, because the retention sum is not always sufficient for, for the vendor actually to charge their obligation to pay for the, uh, the actual Republican stack. If really, really the vendor make a very big profit or very high uh, gains, the retention sum might not enough to cover the tax to be the actual tax to be paid. So in this is this indemnity clause very important for the purchaser. So as a purchaser solicitor, please always remember to put in an indemnity clause saying that the vendor shall indemnify the purchaser on all the tax or all the RPGT payable for this transaction. So please remember on this. So 12 VP clause, the compensation when to deliver. Normally, it's three working days, between three working days, between five working days upon the purchase price, the balance purchase price received, or if there is a late payment, uh, which incurred uh, what we call the interest upon between five working days or three working days upon full payment of balance purchase price together with the late payment interest. Then the vendor has to deliver the recompensation to the, uh, what we call the purchaser. If let's say, is a property sold together with the tenancy, there won't be any uh, physical delivery of vacant position. We will call it as a team delivery of position. We do call it as a vacant position because it's a legal position. Team delivery of legal position. So if let's say the vendor is required to deliver the VP vacant position within a certain period of time, please advise the vendor to deliver within the a great time. If not, if not, the purchaser will ask for the or the purchaser will entitle for the late delivery interest. If you are the vendor lawyer, please make sure the vendor are delivered on time. If you are the purchaser lawyer, please make sure there is a clause in the agreement in the VP clause that if let's say there is any delay on the vendor to deliver of the VP there must be a late deliver interest, okay? This is, to, this is to protect the purchaser interest. Okay, study this one also very important, apportionment of outgoings. If this is not properly done, there will be a lot of issue after the transaction complete. The vendor will call you, the purchaser will call you, okay? Because they got a different, different, uh, they, will, they will have this uh, statement received by them, not supposed under their name or supposed under their name, right? Cut off date for the apportionment must be ascertained in the agreement. It's either on the date where the BPP and the, the balance purchase price or the balance uh, the late payment interest received or on the date the property is delivered, right? Uh, please ascertain the cut off date and all those what we call the uh, uh, water I mean, all, all those credit assessment, uh, cukai tanah, cukai pintu, service charge, um, sinking fund, uh, the property insurance, all those will, and also the indoor water, actually will be uh, calcu calculated up to the, the cut off date. If there's any excess payment made by the vendor, purchaser need to reimburse to the vendor. If there's any outstanding that the vendor is not 
uh, is not paid, then this outstanding or this proportionate sum need to be actually deducted from the balance purchase price before the balance purchase price is released to the vendor. Okay, so the lawyer, the lawyer obligation or the lawyer duty is to request and to make sure all the relevant statement and receipt are up to date. If not up to date, then please come up a list, come up a calculation, calculate, okay, what are the portion, so which, which portion is belong to the vendor, which portion is to the purchaser. Come up with a calculation, a nice calculation, a accurate calculation, send to the vendor or send to the purchaser for review before confirm, before confirm the final opportunity sum, okay. Uh, and also non-registration of MOT, there's a clause, always a clause for this, or non-professional assignment for property under uh, what we call the uh, uh, master title, okay. Non-registration of MOT, okay. If let's say the MOT is presented for registration or for transfer of name, but it cannot be registered or it cannot be perfected, not due to the party force, it's due to uh, some other reason, uh, policy change or what, then how the, actually the party going to deal with this transaction. They can terminate or there's other way they actually want to perfect or to, to, get, uh, to get rid of all those. Please uh, mention it clearly in the agreement, in the clauses. Okay. Uh, oh, there's a typo on this. Uh, there's no late delivery for non-registration. And also uh, a clause for government uh, acquisition. This is not for fun. Please remember to put it in. Uh, so when they have to declare whether there is or there is no uh, notice actually received by the vendor from the government on the acquisition. Sometimes government actually will acquire a certain piece of land for the development, for development uh, like uh, MRT, LRT, hospital, and such other uh, public facility. So make sure the vendor make a correct declaration. And if let's say somehow the vendor received this notice only after SPA sign and before the vendor purchase price received, so how to deal with this? Vendor must actually notify the purchaser within how many days? Then it's up to the purchaser. It must be an option for the purchaser to decide whether to proceed with the sale purchase agreement or to terminate. If terminate, then vendor have to refund all the monies received. If you want to proceed, then vendor have to actually inform the relevant authorities on the purchaser interest in this property or in this land, and then whatever compensation uh, from the authorities for this acquisition is actually belong to the purchaser. But this is always subject to the benefits price price are received by the vendor. Okay, 16. Condition to release balance purchase price. Remember, this is very important because the balance purchase price actually is paid to the uh, vendor solicitors as a stakeholder, uh, stakeholder. If vendor not represented, paid to the purchaser solicitor as stakeholder. There must be a clause always govern this, how actually this uh, balance purchase price and when this actually balance purchase price can be released to the vendor, right? Uh, normally, it could only be released after MOT, after the charge presented at the land office. Normally, after 7 days, 14 days of the presentation, right? Or after the, and also after the apportionment of outgoing dance, or after the relevant deduction of the apportionment outgoings, and after the VP deliver, the vacant position deliver, uh, after all those, if let's say together with the rental, uh, with the tenancy after the rental deposit, I mean, uh, transferred to the purchaser or after the apportionment of rental, uh, all those things is uh, actually a condition to release. So remember, whatever condition must be complied with or must be fulfilled. If not, once the balance purchase price release, I don't think the vendor will entertain you. So the, the lawyer will be, get start will be in trouble. Okay. 17, 18, 19, 20. All those actually is quite standard clause in the sale purchase agreement. 
stamp duty of the transfer, stamp duty on the uh, what we call the SBA, is normally will be paid by the purchaser. This is cost to be paid by the purchaser. Solicitor fees by respective party. Okay, the charge of charge is by the vendor. Uh, consent application. If uh, consent to transfer is by the vendor. If let's say foreigner acquisition is by the purchaser. Uh, and such other costs, relevant costs, okay? Change of ownership, this one also very important. After apportionment done, okay, please don't stop at the apportionment part. Advise your client, put it in writing to go for the change of ownership, right? You see, assessment we can assist. Assessment, uh, to kai siram we can assist. Could rent normally, uh, uh, it will change automatic once the title issued under the purchaser's name. However, if let's say quick rent, I mean the quick rent, however, is a strata title not issued yet, then uh, it has to be actually update the developer or the management body on the change of ownership. Lawyer can just write a letter to the management, inform the management, so this transaction already complete, and then uh, property ownership change from who and who. Uh, cut off it is when, so apportionment done. So just inform the uh, JMB or the management to just change the ownership and CC a letter to the purchaser. Right? This is just to prove we have done our job. As for the water, electricity, and also the uh, indoor water, please advise your client to do the opening account, the closing account by their own because water and electricity we need to put in a fresh deposit. Deposit not transferable. Okay, make sure you have sent out a letter to the vendor or the purchaser. Ask them to proceed with the change of ownership, because if this is not done, and also the parties are not aware on the or on their own obligation, then and all the statement, I mean the management statement, all the water electricity bill will still send to the vendor. Then. The vendor will shout at the lawyer why you never complete a job. And if let's say the statement never reached the purchaser, the purchaser will also chase the purchaser lawyer. Why the thing is not changed? I want everything on my name. So please always, this is very important. Don't think our oh, money received, everything out in, can close file. No, this is very important also. Okay, private caveat as well. If this is a title case, our purchaser lawyers always remember to put in the private caveat clause to protect uh, your client. And the rest is actually is a boilerplate process like the time of essence, uh, the law, gov the governing law, um, date of the agreement, um, the successor's uh, binding clause, and such other, uh, are such other clauses actually behind and at the latter part of the uh, some purchase agreement. So basically, this is all about the uh, terms and condition and the some essential clauses of the SPA. So this is all my sh uh, sharing today. Uh, any question? Mm -hmm.